All right, let's open our Bibles, and I'm going to ask you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And I'm still having trouble with my eyes tearing up constantly. So if they look a little red later on today, that's because I can't help but wipe them continually. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, and the text says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then the verse continues uh, in verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The word perfect doesn't mean flawless or sinless, but uh, he is complete. If a man is a perfect genius, it doesn't mean he has no faults, but it means he possesses all the qualities to form great ideas. Um, on the other hand, if a man's a perfect fool, it means he's a complete fool, right? His, his faults are, are uh, out in the open for all to see. And if the man of God is perfect, it means he has been completely equipped by God with everything he needs to serve Jesus Christ. Last week, I brought a sermon I called The Emblems of the Scriptures. That was part one. And I listed eight things that are found in the Bible to stand for the Bible as a whole, much as the American flag is an emblem of everything that makes up the United States. And those eight things last week were these. The Bible is like a mirror, in no particular order, but a mirror. It's like seed. It's like water. It's also like a lamp. It's likened to gold and to silver. It's called a sword, and it's also likened unto fire. And this will be part two of that outline. Today we're going to do some shopping and pick up a few things. The Bible is found in the marketplace, in a figurative sense. Last week's text, uh, opening text, was Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. And we read in Proverbs 3, verses 13 and 14, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding, for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. How many have ever gone shopping for somebody's gift, and suddenly the right thing appeared on the, in a store, and you told yourself, that's perfect? Well, you should rejoice that way, when you find the words of God. How many of you have a copy of, of the words of God of your own? You're holding in your hands right now. All right. Uh, the Bible says in Acts 17, verse 17, Therefore disputed he in the synagogues, that's Paul, with the Jews and with the devout persons in the market daily with them that met with him, where the business was taking place. Some people were interested in what Paul had to preach. Others were not. But the Word of God is for sale. However, the price of it is not measured in money, but it's measured in your complete surrender to it. And if you don't believe what you're reading is the perfect Word of God, it won't work. It won't do anything good for you. And God has told you to buy it, as it were. Proverbs 23, verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. And the Apostle Peter gives a warning <clears throat> which can be easily applied to the publishers of new Bibles over the last 60 years. And he says this, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Second Peter 2 verse 3. 
we finally updated the English language. It's now more understandable than ever before. It's clearer than ever before. We summoned only the best scholars to produce this new translation. Um, and this, this translation, we hope, will last for generations until we need to update it five years from now, right? And through some great uh, intellectual feat of, of, of psychic uh, ledger domain, we've discerned what the, what the writers of the Bible actually meant to say, rather than what they actually wrote. And God says to watch out for that kind of deception. But people are more ignorant of the scriptures, of the characters of the Bible, the stories of the Bible, the lessons of the Bible than ever before. You're living in the most uh, scripturally ignorant time that's ever existed in the history of the church. And there are more translation versions of the Bible than ever before. You might ask, well, why if with so many translations and so many new versions always coming out, are people so woefully ignorant of the Bible? And that's because if you're handed a Bible and you're told this is the most recent up-to-date translation and you've been paying attention, you know good and well that within four or five years there's going to be another new up-to-date translation. So you may as well not commit your loyalties to that one because another one's going to come along demanding your loyalty. So people are not loyal to any of them. I have, I have yet to meet the person reading the NIV who says, I'm an NIV Bible believer. I believe every word in it is perfect. They don't exist. But um, let's do some spiritual shopping today with the Emblems of the Scriptures, Part 2. And first, we need to stop in the household goods department and buy a hammer. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Something that gets hit with a hammer knows it's been hit. Um, Kent Hovind often remarks that uh, insects and cockroaches may develop resistance to insecticides, but there's yet to be a cockroach that can resist a hammer. And spiritually, the Word of God can deliver a forceful blow that hits you harder than you thought it would. If you thought that living good and being a good person was the standard by which God will one day let you into heaven, and then you read all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and all our uh, iniquities like the wind have taken us away, that can hit you pretty hard. It is if you're willing to concede that what you're reading are the words of God, it flies in the face of nearly everything all religions teach, all denominations teach. Be a good person and God will judge you on your goodness. That person is on his way to hell because he doesn't know the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you were ever led to think, for example, if you were ever led to think that the death penalty, capital punishment, was no longer in effect in the New Testament age, only love for everyone, and then reading through your Bible, you come across Paul's words, Acts 25, verse 11. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Acknowledging that the death penalty was still in effect in his day. By the way, it's often preached by ministers who aren't paying attention that uh, Paul uh, hauled off Christians and led them to their deaths. He did not. He, he imprisoned some. But he never, you'll never find in the scriptures that he led anyone to their death. That's why he could say, uh, if I've committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But he was confident that he had not. And then later on, Acts 25, uh, um, Festus, the, the governor, says, I found in him nothing worthy of death after they examined his life. But the word of God is like a hammer. Uh, secondly, while we're in the hardware section... We need to pick up some nails. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 11. The words of the wise are as goads. That's a sharp stick you poke someone with. And as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies 
which are given from one shepherd. Nails are hammered in to hold things together. It's marvelous how well Bible doctrines hold together with the King James text and the King James language. Uh, if you want to discern a biblical doctrine, the rule of the scriptures is you ought to have two or even three uh, scripture verses that testify together, that are saying the same thing, or they're all pointing you in the same direction. A doctrine is the whole Bible's teaching on any given subject. But the modern Bibles have changed so much of the vocabulary that the natural system of cross-references in the Bible is destroyed. You can't compare Scripture with Scripture and let the Scriptures interpret the Scriptures any longer because they've changed words, changed vocabulary here and there, and the two verses that used to match each other in the King James text no longer do in many of the new ones. Things fall apart um, often, and they don't hold together. But uh, the words of God are also said to be like nails. All right, now let's head over to the grocers and pick up some bread. We bought a case of water last week at Ephesians 5.26, the washing of water by the word. You need water for every function in your body. If you don't and you get severely dehydrated, um, internal organs can shut down, your kidneys can fail, and eventually can lead to death. But let's buy some bread. Bread and water have been the basic diet of prison inmates and very poor people for thousands of years. Um, it may not taste very good, but evidently it's sufficient to keep a human body alive. Maybe you'll lose a lot of weight on that diet, but it's sufficient to keep a human body functioning. And um, from most bread comes a source of carbohydrates, magnesium, iron, vitamin B. And let me say this, nowhere, nowhere in the Bible, either Testament, are the written scriptures specifically likened unto bread. Christ is called the Word of God, but you can't learn the Bible without knowing Him first. And you can't learn about Jesus Christ without reading the Bible. He said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven, John 6, verse 51. But bread has always been considered something you need every day. Give us this day our daily bread, the Lord's Prayer says. Or in Korea or Far East Asia, it would be give us this rice, our daily rice, right? Rice with every meal. And uh, it's the same, it, it serves the same function of carbohydrates and starch. And uh, rice can be adapted to all sorts of forms. Uh, I had some rice cake uh, uh, dessert earlier this morning before church started. That tastes good. And, uh, but, but those things are, are necessary every day. You know, the person who makes the primary income in a household is said to be the breadwinner. And if he does that successfully, it's called putting bread on the table. Uh, in colloquial terms, someone with a lot of bread or a lot of dough is someone with a lot of money, like Brother Everett. <laughs> and some great innovation is said to be the best thing since sliced bread. Right? But we can easily draw a spiritual application from bread. Since the Jews in the wilderness had to go out and gather manna fresh every day. And with that manna, they baked it in their pans and made bread out of it. And the Levites made 12 loaves of showbread to put inside the tabernacle every single morning. So shouldn't you and I give God uh, some time in his word every day? You won't be sorry. But the word of God is like bread. Fourthly, now let's go over to the fruit and vegetable section. We're going to buy some apples. Proverbs 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures 
of silver. One good thing on top of another good thing. We've been having our church summer camp the last few years up in Oak Glen, California. That's sort of Apple Farm Central in this part of the state. And just before you reach the camp, you drive right through those old barns and country buildings. That's their shopping center in Oak Glen. And anything related to apples can be found there. You want candied apples, chocolate-covered apples, caramel apples, applesauce, um, apple butter, apple pies. Those are all good. And that's where you get them. Uh, who doesn't like the sweetness of a good apple? I, I, I suppose everyone does. A lot of people, they balk at eating fruit. When in their hearts they know fruit is healthy for them. They ought to eat more of it. But, um, and they're over, you know, there are over 7,500 varieties of apples that are cultivated throughout the world. And just a few of them that, that are familiar to us. Uh, the Fuji, the Gala, the Red Delicious, the Golden Delicious, Granny Smith, the Sugar Bee, Yellow Transparent, Discovery Apples, Ambrosia, Macintosh, etc. And they are in all shades of color from red to green to yellow to very, very pale, some with sort of a combination of colors to them. And, uh, but apples generally offer a good source of fiber uh, and also some natural sugars, vitamin C and vitamin B6. And eating an apple won't make you fat. Isn't that good to know? Uh, when you enjoy reading your Bible, when you enjoy hearing it preached, when you enjoy the sweetness of its promises, it's like opening that refrigerator in the, you know, right, the, the, the crisper drawer and finding the last apple that someone overlooked and it's, it's perfectly aged, it's crisp, it's been waiting with your name on it just about, and you dig into that and it's just, it's fantastic. I don't have the same reaction to bananas for some reason, but, but apples, I think everybody likes. And uh, I, I like the Korean pears, the Asian pears, although as an American, they don't have the sweetness that I'm used to in apples. They taste good. They do have a sweetness and they're ginormous, <laughs> but, um, but you can't beat apples. And apples are, are found, farmed and cultivated everywhere in the world. That's one of the universal fruits. And uh, you should enjoy every bite. Just like reading your Bible, you should enjoy every single verse that you come across. And an apple a day won't keep the doctor away. However, some studies have shown that adults who eat an apple every day tend to need fewer prescription drugs later in life than adults who do not. And I don't know if there's any direct correlation to those two elements or not. But points number five and six together, let's go uh, get two more items that are usually located in proximity to each other in the grocery store. And they are meat and milk. Meat and milk. Hebrews 5 verses 12 through 14. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Meat, of course, is the animal flesh that is eaten as food. Uh, if you're a meat eater, you're said to be a carnivore, carne from Latin meaning flesh. However, that definition for meat is actually of recent uh, origin. Uh, in your King James Bible, in the Old Testament, a meat offering was bread baked in a pan. It was not the flesh of an animal. Uh, it was offered at the altar. Leviticus 2 verses 1 through 11 describe the baking of a meat offering. And it was to be unleavened. And the term meat 
uh, used to mean all food in general. Now that definition is um, archaic today, but today we think of meat as only referring to animal flesh. Meat is a major source of protein in your diet. You can always tell these people that look sickly and, and pale and unhealthy, they're all ultra vegetarians, they don't eat any meat. They look ghostly like they haven't been outdoors in, in months. They're all pale, you know. And then now you have kids who are not only are adopting this uh, uh, vegan vegetarian diet, but they go to extremes, they dye their hair jet black, and uh, they like the pale look. They like that pale, emaciated, uh, death warmed over look. I work in a funeral home and I particularly don't like it, but, um, <laughs> but uh, until, you have a strong, until you have strong teeth uh, and a developed metabolism, you're not able to chew on and eat meat. Meat, for our purposes, represents uh, a more challenging subject matter found in the Bible. Things uh, that aren't easily understood on the surface. Doctrines that need to be carefully studied and carefully weighed before uh, propagating them to other people. A new Christian, a babe, as Paul puts it, doesn't need to worry about eating strong meat. Uh, or he doesn't need to worry about who the Antichrist is. He was here once and he's going to appear again. Uh, he doesn't need to fixate himself on what the tree of the knowledge was. By the way, it wasn't an apple. He doesn't need to fixate himself on a lot of tangential things that are not directly connected with him being uh, born again. Those things are interesting and they are icing on top of the cake, but you need to concentrate on the, the, the uh, essential doctrines of being a new believer. And uh, ha the new believer does, however, need to be sure of his faith in Christ uh, and Christ's death alone. Uh, he needs to understand Christ's sacrifice for his sins, past, present, and future. He needs to uh, uh, understand his security as a believer. You can never lose your salvation. Thank the Lord for that. Um, he needs to understand God's providing a perfect book for him to hold in his hands and read and have um, uh, direct communication from God by that book. It needs to have confidence and hope in Christ, uh, always hearing his prayers and um, always living within him and everything else that comes with being a new believer in Jesus Christ. And that leads me to the subject of milk, um, which we just picked up and it's in our shopping cart now. Uh, the Apostle Peter writes, 1 Peter 2, verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. There are a lot of people who are occupied and obsessed with some unusual subject matter in the Bible. They want to know uh, when the Antichrist is going to appear. They want to know how the communications and uh, computer systems are going to generate a mark for every person on earth. They want to know if there's an opening in the Antarctic which leads into the underworld, uh, so forth, things of that nature. But they couldn't tell you what it means to be saved. They couldn't give you verses on eternal security if their souls depended on it. They're, they're sidetracked onto things that are not as essential to a believer uh, as those other things. But Brother and sister Banuelos, new baby. She can't eat pork chops yet, right? She needs milk to grow. It's a good source of vitamin D, calcium. It helps the bones to grow strong and uh, also the teeth. So eventually she can eat meat. My dad used to joke about how all of us kids would sit there just eating children's food when they take us out to dinner as children. And he says, he just turned around, before you know it, we're all ordering steak. And um, this is like, the, we all grew up so quickly. And I suppose every 
um, parent has that same observation about their own children. One last item on our shopping list today is we need to pick up some honey. Psalm 119 verse 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Honey is a good source of sugars. It's been processed by bees and not by men. Honey has also been studied for its uh, potential treatment of skin burns, as well as coughs, and uh, as well as allergies. It has certain um, antibacterial uh, properties, but you're not thinking of those things when you eat honey. You're just thinking how sweet it tastes on a piece of buttered bread, right? The word, the word mellifluous, I'll spell it for you, M-E-L-L-I-F-L-U-O-U-S, mellifluous, means flowing smoothly and sweetly like honey. And that's how that's how the King James Bible sounds to the English ear that hears it. Smooth and sweet. Last week I began with Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Before we conclude this sermon, let me read to you that same verse from a modern translation, which I, I just pulled off the shelf at random this morning. Here's that verse in the Good News Version. The explanation of your teachings gives light and brings wisdom to the ignorant. Those words do not flow smoothly and sweetly. They sound like someone dropped a spoon in the garbage disposal. As I finish, uh, all of these items suggest that the Bible is complete equipment for the believer in this world, man or woman, perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And Dr. Ruckman used to comment on this subject that if you had a mirror and seed and water, a lamp, a sword, gold, silver, fire, a hammer, nails, bread, apples, meat, milk, and even honey, and you weren't lazy, you could survive in any jungle in the world. You could survive in any hostile environment you were dropped into. You had those things and knew what to do with them. And those are 15 emblems of the scriptures. And I pray that they're a blessing to you as you consider them in the future.